You know, uh, Vince Foster, we've put on a number of shows about Vince Foster, the most senior White House advisor ever, ever killed since the president. And uh, we've gotten into the medical aspects of that uh, shooting event, uh, allegedly a suicide. And one of the men that has been bringing us that information for quite a while now on the Radio Detective Show uh, has been uh, one of the sharpest lawyers out there. He is, was in Washington, D.C. when we started. He's moved back to Los Angeles. He's practicing law in Los Angeles now. But he continues uh, to deal in the subject. He's been before the court with uh, various uh, motions and various FOIA, uh, that's Freedom of Information Act request uh, issues, uh, for various things regarding the Vince Foster, uh, what I think is a murder. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to speak with him tonight, and you can too, as we go along in this, and particularly the ones that maybe are somewhat familiar with Alan in the background of this thing. But I'll have Alan go into it a little bit before we get to the nitty-gritty of what I think he has come up with that I wanted you to be aware of. Alan, welcome to the show, sir. Hi, Jerry. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How you been? Well, very, very good, and uh, thank you for uh, having me on to share this with your listeners. You bet. Can you, Before we go to the, the new stuff, would you do me a favor, Alan, and give them an overview? To, and We, don't, of course, don't have time to go into detail, but kind of a summary of the Vince Foster issues that we've discussed over the year. Yeah, Vince Foster was a law partner of Hillary Clinton for uh, many years in Little Rock, and uh, he was found dead in a park across uh, the river in uh, Virginia in July of 1993. Officially, was ruled a suicide. Officially, they say he put a uh, 38 caliber revolver in his mouth, and the bullet went out the back of his mouth and uh, into the back of his mouth and out his head. Uh, supposedly, an exit wound three inches uh, below the top of the head. That's the official version, but uh, there are many, many problems with the official version, uh, one of which is that uh, the autopsy doctor wrote on the, ex, uh, on the autopsy report that x-rays were taken and then later said no x-rays were taken. He said that the machine was broken. An independent investigator named Rita Irvine from Accuracy and Media in Washington, D.C., contacted the x-ray repair company, found that it was not, that x-ray machine was not broken. That was never pursued by the federal authorities. There was no blowout material uh, that was uh, at the park, as you would expect from a 38 caliber high-velocity bullet uh, fired at the, in that manner. You would think that a lot of uh, biological matter, brain, blood, bone, would be uh, all over the area, but it wasn't. And uh, it just goes on and on with uh, various uh, problems, especially with the official documents. And... That's what uh, I have to talk about tonight. Uh, one of the official documents, I got something new from the Office of Independent Counsel. Uh, and uh, you want me to talk about that? Yeah, let, that? let's, uh, and, and just to add to it, uh, just to, for a, a little bit more, was there's yeah. all kinds of problems, folks, with the uh, placement of people in and around this park, the time the body was discovered, uh, other activities. What's that bodyguard? Uh, yeah, well, I can tell you there was a, a witness who was in the park who did not see the body that day. He was just an average citizen named Patrick Knowlton. He's not so average. He's very courageous. Right. And, by the way, people can go to his website, which is www.fbicoverup.com, and there is a very, very large uh, report, over 500 pages, which really spells out all the details, and they have all the exhibits up there at fbicoverup.com. But uh, he saw... Uh, a suspicious man in the park at the time uh, when Foster was supposedly already dead in the park, and he also saw a, a car that was in the park, which should have been Foster's car, given the government story about Foster driving himself to the park and then walking in deep into the park and killing himself. At the time that Mr. Knowlton was in the parking lot of this park, he should have seen Foster's uh, silver Honda, uh, there were other witnesses in the park that day, civilians, who also should have seen that silver uh, Honda. But they all reported to the police that they saw a brown uh, car. Some said Honda, some said uh, another Japanese brand and so forth. But none of them reported seeing the car that was Foster's, a silver Honda or gray Honda. And they reported, Alan, remember, 
as I recall, and the brown one had the Arkansas license plates. That's right. That's right. And uh, that's very unusual, and that car uh, has never been tracked down. Right. And uh, Mr. Uh, Knowlton is one courageous witness who uh, would not give in to uh, uh, intimidation from some FBI agents who he is now suing in federal court. Uh, they're they're going to be up on appeal soon. They got bounced out of uh, the lower court. Uh, but there, uh, there are a lot of other problems. There was an FBI memo that said that there was, this was written, uh, uh, I think, a day or two after the autopsy that said no exit wound. Mm-hmm. The problem with that is the official story says there was an exit wound in the, you know, the, out, out the back of Mr. Foster's skull. Right. And this FBI memo is not commented upon by the two independent counsels who issued reports on the Foster case. Starr's report came out in October of 97, Fisk's report, Robert Fisk. Star's predecessor, that report came out in June of 1994. Neither of them talk about this FBI memo. That FBI memo only became public because uh, Reed Irvine's accuracy in media got it out of the FBI with a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit. But the major media has never talked about that document. People could see that document at my website. And by the way, let me tell people real quickly how to get there. One easy way is to go to your station's website, which is, uh, I believe, uh, kmphfm.com right. and click on the radio detective link and I believe you have a link on your portion of that page to right. my website. Right, we do. So kmphfm.com go to the radio detective and then click on the Alan Favish link and you'll find a lot of Vince Foster information including the new document which I, I'll, I'll tell you about uh, right now if you like. Yeah, let's get in uh, now. Uh, set up the background on, on how the first document Sure. came to be, and then we'll just let you run with it, Alan, if okay. you will. But w- what we have here, there was only one doctor, one actual medical doctor, to view Vincent Foster's body at the park. Of course, other doctors looked at it later as it went to the morgue and the hospital and the autopsy was done. This one doctor, his name is Dr. Donald Hout, and he worked for uh, the Virginia, the, the Office of Chief Medical Examiner for the state of Virginia. He's not, he was not a federal employee. He wrote a two-page medical report, uh, and on page one, he says that the uh, cause of death was a perforating gunshot wound, perforating meaning it goes in and out, uh, gunshot wound, mouth, hyphen, head. And uh, that matches the official story. And then you look on page two of his report, and it's kind of unusual. It says mouth to neck. There's a difference between mouth to neck and mouth to head. Right. Somebody's going to commit suicide with a gun in the mouth. They don't want to make it a mouth out the back of the neck because if you miss the brain and you're just shooting out the, you'll make yourself a quadriplegic. You won't kill yourself. Right. You want to put it up in the roof of your mouth and you want to hit your brain and uh, ensure death that way. So there's this internal contradiction with the Hout report. What's interesting is when Kenneth Starr issued his report in 1997, he quoted the mouth hyphen head language that's on page one of the Hout report and totally ignored page two. Did not tell the American people about that at all, so they don't know that there was this internal contradiction. Right. Now, we didn't know about the Hout report until Patrick Knowlton and another citizen researcher who you've had on the show, Hugh Sprunt, were in the National Archives uh, in 1997, and they found a copy of this Hout report. Now, what's uh, interesting is they found a certified copy, which means that Somebody went to the office of the chief medical examiner and wanted a copy of the original. And so uh, Dr. Beyer, who was the autopsy doctor for Hout, certified a copy of it. They take the original out of the files, make a photocopy of it, put the original back, and then Dr. Beyer writes on the photocopy uh, words to the effect that this is a true and correct copy, and he signs that. And that was provided to Congress. And then from Congress, I believe, I'm not 100% sure, but that's how I think this copy uh, of the certified copy got in the National Archives. What I uncovered was I did a Freedom of Information Act request to the Office of Independent Counsel because I wanted to look at the original document, Mm -hmm. thinking that they might have it rather than the state of Virginia, because there's something else interesting on the Hout Report. When you look closely at page one where it says mouth, hype, and head, it looks like there was a word there before head and somebody tried to white it out but didn't do a real good job and left like the, some, the bottoms of four letters of a four-letter word right. that use a correction tape or, or, or correction fluid. And then the word head was typed in next to that weird area where it looks like there's the remnants of these four letters. It looked like it was improperly altered. 
So uh, to solve the mystery, I wanted to look at the original. Well, the Office of Independent Counsel in the last uh, couple weeks told me that they don't have the original. They have a certified copy, and they gave me a copy of their certified copy. And it's different from the official certified copy that was found in the National (laughs) Archives. And how is it different? Well, you look for that uh, mouth-head language on the front page that looks like there was another word, which a lot of people think might have been the word neck to match what's on page two, mouth to neck, and then somebody made this improper alteration and changed neck to head. But we're not positive. We won't know until we can get a look at the original. But when you look at the copy from the Office of Independent Counsel, it's clean. It says mouth, height, and head, and doesn't look like any improper alteration was done. Mm -hmm. So you have two certified copies. One was certified in November of 1994 by Dr. Beyer that went to, I believe, Congress, ended up in the National Archives. A second certified copy that was certified three months later at the end of January of 95 by Dr. Beyer, and that went to the OIC. Two certified copies, which should be identical except for the certification, because that's stamped on there by the guy who does the certifying at the time he does it, but they're not identical. One of them has this weird area where it looks like maybe the word neck was improperly all whited out, and then uh, somebody typed in head. And the second certified copy, which looks perfectly clean, mouth hyphen head. Now, people will see this new document and the old one, the one found at the National Archives, on my website. Again, they can go to kmphfm.com, go to the radio detective portion of that, and get a link to my page. Now, this, now Alan, this goes right to the issue of what... You and I discussed one time about the positioning, the improbable positioning of the gun they tried to put out also with regard to the jaw dislocation issue. Yes. Remember? When you look at the autopsy report in detail, and at my website you'll find a link to a fellow named J.C. Huntington's website where he spells out very clearly, looking at the official autopsy documents, how in order to have the wound path as described in the official reports, Foster's jaw would have had to have been off his head (laughs) when the shot was fired, which makes no sense whatsoever. And by the way, if people go to worldnetdaily.com, there's a story by Charles Smith in today's worldnetdaily.com, www.wnd.com for short, and uh, they could read a story about what we're talking about right now. Which is actually... Contributed by you, but they got mixed up on the name. Yeah, yeah, I helped Charles uh, a lot with that. It was supposed to be an op-ed by me originally, but anyway, but if you go to worldnetdaily.com today, it's still up there, and they they archive all their stories. So anytime people want to get to it really quick, you can always go to the World Net Daily site and just go to their search 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 engine and search for, uh, like, foster death, and that'll and this story by Charles Smith will come up. You know, I want to just go back now. The documents we're talking about here tonight yeah. that that you've come up with, all else is the same in the document except that, right? Yes. And so, truly, uh, this is evidence that somebody's tampered with that wording. Now, let's examine for a moment, if we can, Alan. Yeah. Uh, you as an attorney and me as an investigator, say we're working together, and yeah. we've got this piece of evidence now. Has come. What would that indicate to you? Okay, well, let me throw something at you and, and, and uh, tell me what you think. Now, it is possible, I'm trying to think of an innocent explanation for it, an innocent explanation would be that the original does not have any improper alteration, and it says mouth, hyphen, head on the front, and there's nothing strange about it, and it's perfectly clean. Then, in November of 1994, where they're going to make their first certified copy of that original, they put it on the photocopy machine, and there's some little dust or dirt or something on the glass of the photocopy machine that just happens to be at that exact spot where it it's ne- it comes out next to the word head to make it look like something was improperly whited out. Mm-hmm. And they make this photocopy, and it looks weird, but they don't do anything about it, and buyer certifies it, and that goes to wherever, Congress probably, and then ends up in the National Archives. Then, three months later, he's asked to make another certified copy. Again, they take the clean original, put it on the photocopy machine, but this time there's no schmutz or dirt or anything on the copy machine. So a, ver- a clean photocopy comes out, and he uh, certifies that. That goes to the OIC, and that's what I get now, and that's why that one's clean. That would be, theoretically, 
I guess, an innocent explanation that there was just some dirt on the photocopy machine the day back in November when they made the first one that ended up in the archives. Right. But when you look at the document, it would have to be quite a coincidence, especially given the controversy about the inconsistent language, mouth to head on page one, mouth to neck on page two, to, for uh, dirt to end up just at the very area in the document where it looks like a word was partially altered. Right. That would be theoretically an innocent explanation, but kind of far-fetched. Right. Now, wh what do you think? Well, now let's take it one step further. Yeah. Then we go back to the uh, difficulty we had with uh, the two guns, uh, the silver gun and the black gun routine. Remember right, that? right. Let me tell people about that real okay. quick. And that was uh, when people go to my website, they can see color photos of some of the evidentiary pieces of the case. They can see the car, see how his car was gray and nobody would describe it as brown. And they could also see the color the gun. The official death gun is, is black. It's blued steel, technically, and, and you can tell people uh, that looks black to the naked eye uh, in most cases, and certainly in this case. Well, there's an FBI interview with Lisa Foster, the widow, and uh, that's uh, an available document. It's up on my website. And the FBI uh, took notes during that interview, and they apparently showed Lisa the official death gun, and she says to them, this is according to the FBI's own rendition of this interview, she says to them, oh, that looks like our silver gun that we had in Arkansas. I'm just paraphrasing right now. Mm -hmm. Well, if you were reading an interview of somebody where they are shown a gun, and sh the response is, oh, that looks like our silver gun, you would think she's being sh so shown a silver gun. Right. Unless she's got some weird eyesight problem, which there's <laughs> no evidence of that. <laughs> right. <laughs> well... The problem is the official death gun's black. Right. So it looks like the FBI showed her a silver gun, and uh, they shouldn't have been doing that because the official death gun is black. Why would they show her a silver gun? Because nine days after the death, ten months before that FBI interview, the park police showed her a photograph of the official death gun, which was black, and she said, no, 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 that doesn't look like uh, anything we owned. We owned a silver gun. Right. So and, that, like and, that, and that goes to the heart of the suicide issue. Yeah, it, it looks like uh, they, they were trying to make it sound like he owned the gun that they wanted to say was the official death weapon. Right. And they just couldn't get anybody in the family to identify that official death weapon as something that he owned. Now, I want to throw one more thing in, Alan, if I can, just yeah. to go back. And, and as you know, you and I have worked together uh, on this show talking about this stuff a number of times, but... I'd like to have motive, at least, somewhere in the case. And I know in, in the court, motive's not really evidence, but in a true sense of the word, but it's always there. You always need to bring it up. Oh, sure you do. And uh, you got this phone call, like, the day before. Remember we talked about with Jerry Luther Parks down in Little Rock? Right. Like Jerry Parks was somebody who worked on security for the Clinton uh, campaign in 1992. Right. And, and Parks is talking to Foster, and Foster is saying to Parks, this is according to Parks' wife, right? Uh, uh, something to the effect he was going to turn over some documents to Hillary Clinton. Right. And Parks says, on his end, overheard by his wife, if you do that, I'm a dead man. Right. And Foster said something to the effect, uh, reported by Parks to his wife, something to the effect, I can't stand it anymore, I've, I'm going to do it, or words to that effect. I'm just paraphrasing a little bit. Uh -huh. Then Parks uh, hangs up and he's scared to death, according to the family when they're interviewed by, what's his name? Ambrose Evans Pritchard. Yeah, Amb Ambrose Pritchard. Now, interestingly enough, the next day, Foster gets bumped off. Then two months later, uh, Parks is at an intersection in Little Rock, Arkansas, and he's assassinated sitting in his car. Right. Uh, remember the tie here now between him saying, I'm going to get bumped, I'm going to, I'm going to get killed if you do that. Uh, and then later on, there's a brown car at the scene of Foster's deal with an Arkansas plate on it. Right. Which, according to some, they obviously did not even try to track. They right. didn't try to. But the question is, why is there a brown car clear up in Washington, D.C., from Arkansas, in the very parking lot, where they found Foster's body. 
Right. Question mark. Unanswered part of the question. Right. Now let's go back to the house, and I'll have you tell us. Uh huh. This apartment or whatever he remember that written on the paper about he was going to go to the apartment. There uh, was, well, there there was. Uh, I don't know which piece of paper you're referring. Well, there was a piece of paper that Hugh discussed, and where they found his Foster's own writing, where he had the, the apartment noted there. Oh yeah. Okay. And it was supposed to be right near the area where they worked, obviously. Uh-huh. Uh, all of that was something that wasn't followed up on. Nobody went out to discover what that apartment was about. Right. Uh, all those loose ends that tie back again to the whole comment that started the ball rolling, in my humble opinion, uh-huh. was this phone call between Parks and him where he, Foster, was going to turn over something to Hillary Clinton, and that on that document had Hillary and the apartment. Remember? Yes. And that would have meant to me, looking at it after the fact, because that was written on the notepad the day he left his office and then didn't come back, that he might have been headed to see Hillary at the apartment, except Hillary was supposedly in Los Angeles. Yes, she was out of town. And that whole thing is strange because then I researched it and found out that she immediately cut things short out here, went to Little Rock from... Los Angeles, the timing of that whole thing and her decision to cut things short was before his body was discovered in the park. Right. And that opened up that whole door for, I think it was Larry Nichols came on with you and I Uh and said that that gal he talked to said they knew about it before the time period they should have known about it. And, And that's when we questioned Larry about it and he gave up his source to us, which is a gal that worked right there with all of them. So keep that in mind, Alan. We're going to take a short break. My special guest in this hour is Alan Favish. He's a lawyer. He's one of the sharpest lawyers I've ever run into in my life. He practices law in Los Angeles, and he's formerly in Washington, D.C. When we met, he's been on the show a number of times talking about the Clinton administration and uh, several of the unanswered uh, questions uh, regarding the uh, involvement of some strange activity around the killing of Vince Foster. And I want to ask the listening audience before we go back to Alan. And I thought about this during the break. I'd like for you to call us. And you've heard Alan on the show before. And I'd like to know if the general public is so asleep at the switch that they don't believe there's something wrong with this Foster death. Am I the only one and Alan the only one and, and a few of the others, Hugh Sprunt, that believe there's something out of order in regard to Vince Foster. Why has this not been looked into further? I want to know. I mean, why do you think, why do, why do you as a radio detective listener believe the government has not gone out? This is the, what is this, Alan? The highest ranking White House official except for the killing of John Kennedy. Isn't that true? Yeah, the, the, the highest uh, ranking uh, White House official to die a violent uh, death since John Kennedy. And I'd like to hear from you out there and and just tell us, What's your read on this? Do you think the Clinton administration is covering this up? Uh, do you think that, uh, why is it handled this way, in your opinion? What is going on? And does it affect things like Waco? And does it affect things like, we've heard Foster had a hand in laundering money overseas uh, for the uh, for the administration? His strange trips over to Switzerland and those bank accounts and all that. Is Do you think your administration's corrupt? I guess, Alan, that sums it up, huh? Yeah, and, and let me add one quick thing. Uh, Apparently, the original of this Hout report is with the uh, Office of the Chief Medical Examiner of the state of Virginia. So uh, with Charlie Smith of World Net Daily, um, well, first, I orally contacted that office and said, I'd like to see the original, because that would solve this mystery. Just let the public see the original and see if there is uh, whiteout or correction fluid or something like that on the original. They won't let me see the original document. Right. And it's not a matter of anybody's privacy. We already have a copy of the document. Right. So that was found from the National Archives. I just got one released from the OIC. We already have all the information, except for what may be under any improper alteration. And so we did an official Virginia FOIA request. And uh, I'm told by Charlie Smith, and this is the first time I've said this uh, you know, publicly, but he just got a response to that where they are officially denying us the right to look at the original. Um, and they supplied him with a photocopy of the document. I haven't seen that yet, so I don't know if that's 
a third certified copy, or is that a photocopy of one of the other two certified copies? So I'll get that uh, hopefully in the mail tomorrow. You know, uh, go back to independent counsel's office. Yeah. What's your read on that whole operation there? Were they covering up stuff themselves as much as they were uh, involved in that whole thing with Lewinsky and you know, all the stuff they brought out? But, I mean, I hear more and more now about things they knew they didn't bring up. What's, what's your read on that, Alex? Well, with the Lewinsky thing, they did a very good job with the report based on all the evidence that we know about. Uh, but with regard to Vince Foster, like I said, here's a star's office putting forward a report in October of 97 about the Foster death, and they quote the mouth-head language on page one of Hout's report, totally ignoring the contradictory language mouth-to-neck right. on page two. That's just not being honest and, and upfront with the American people. There's an FBI memo saying no exit wound, which is totally 180 degrees away from the official version, which does have an exit wound. That's not even mentioned in Starr's report. Well, I've, I, I, and you're right. And when you mentioned earlier, I've been to the, the scene of a number of homicides in my career and, and shooting homicides. And, um, and when you put a gun in your mouth and you squeeze the trigger, you got what's called blowback material in the barrel of the gun and all over it. Uh-huh. And it's just a natural phenomena that occurs. And uh, some criminalists would tell you it's about the gases expanding, contracting, all that crap. But you do have blowback material in that barrel. In fact, uh, I know of a police officer I investigated who was accused of putting a gun up against somebody and shooting them. Actually, it was a highway patrol officer. And I said, oh, yeah, and this guy said, oh, yeah, and we saw him do it and all this stuff. And I went over, and I, before the officer was there, and before he could do anything with his gun, I grabbed it from him. I was a, I was a homicide lieutenant. Uh-huh. I took it from the highway patrol. Give me your gun. And he thought he was busted. And uh, I said, just give me your gun. I took the gun away from him. I says, go with one of the deputies. I don't want you going unarmed, but I'm going to check this out. I knew he didn't do it. Uh-huh. But I took that gun. I went right to the lab, and I had him look at it. And that gun, not only had it never been any blowback material in it, it had never been fired that night. <laughs> and so we busted the other guy for making a false police report and come to find out it was his brother, oh. uh, actually brother-in-law, that was a suspect in killing the guy. But they were going to try to hang it on the copper, uh-huh. on the CHP guy. And I'm, you know, this stuff, this stuff. When you get into this, and in, in the and the year 2000 is going to be a bizarre year. We thought 99 was bad, Alan. <laughs> I mean, we got things we're going to talk about in the year 2000. That, but this whole thing with Vince Foster is a bunch of BS. That, that didn't happen the way they said it happened. They know it didn't happen that way. And any senior FBI agent that's been around a while, I'm not talking about the new guys that are learning the trade, but any senior investigator knows it didn't happen the way this, the official record is. And and you guys uh, are trying to ferret it out, and now you reach another roadblock with this administration and the government that uh, it's just like pulling hen's teeth to get anything out of those people. Yeah. Let's yeah. let's take a call from Yogi in Tulare County. Yogi, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, hello. How are Hi, you? Hey, how you doing? Good. How are you? Yeah, great. Fine show. I listen to it all the time now. Hey, thank you. I'd have called you from Goshen, but uh, you don't like Goshen. <laughs> <laughs> You know, what, why is it, now you think about it, everybody has been close to Clinton that knows him inside and out, all comes up committing suicide. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? Or, or, right. or, or plane crashes. Yeah. You know, it, it, it don't, don't seem right. And you know he's a coward. Did you hear what it cost for him to fly to Pakistan? No. I think the news said $93 million. He had 18 fighter jets escort him over there. In fact, they took him away from my, uh, uh, that's what the news said, uh, took him on, on uh, standby, emergency standby uh, fighter pilots, took them away to escort him over to Pakistan. Plus, I think they said he had 26 other planes with him, too. Well, I don't know. I didn't read the story, but none of that surprises me. That trip to China cost us a fortune. Remember, Alan, that deal? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, this is on, um, and my wife called me up yesterday because I missed that the world news. Right. She was telling me about it. Yeah, uh, but yeah, he's going to save. He's saving money. Yeah, his trips cost uh, more than uh, what the independent council has had to spend because of his uh, perjury. Well, I mean, they, they went into you know bad mouth and star about forty million, wasn't it? Right. And here, if if the if Yogi's information is correct and it cost ninety three mil, you see, see, Clinton takes a whole bunch of people with him. He doesn't need to take. Uh, no. I mean, he takes he takes reams of people over there and. 
and it just is a big old vacation for him on our money. I mean, his wife's running for office on our money. Yep. Uh, they're after her. She spent 140000 so far of our money to fly around in, in an Air Force plane back there in New York to run for office. These people, I mean, they're, they're, they're besides being what I've said they are before, they're a couple of leeches. Yeah, what, um, what's bad about it is other Yahoo Gore, he, he's going to probably get in, more than likely. Uh, you know, it, it, what, uh, I think, wasn't it on your show, he says he's going to try and take the Second Amendment out? Well, what I said about, no, he Gore never going to get on this show. I wouldn't care if he walked in this room. Well, I'd, have, I'd have him arrested for trespassing. Yeah, what I mean is, but I'm, I'm going to tell you what I said here is Gore's taking the position that the Constitution is a living document. Now, what the Constitution is is anything but a living document. But the reason he says that, as the story goes on, is that he claims this document changes as society changes. He wants to get away from the fact that it's ironclad on the Second Amendment and the First Amendment, period. No, he wants it to change as we go along and times change and people's attitudes change and all this so that they don't have to deal with things like the Second Amendment. Well, Jerry, in a sense, the Constitution is a living document and it can change because it has a built-in mechanism for change. It can be amended, but that's a direct function of our democracy. The right. people vote, the state legislatures vote, and that's how it should be changed. That's how it lives. Right, but, but what he means is it should be judges who change it, yeah, judges who aren't elected that's and right. who aren't accountable to the electorate. Those are the people who should change it, and that's what uh, it contradicts the original framers' intent about how it should uh, change and live. Right, and, he, and he's approached it on the Second Amendment and the First Amendment uh, twice now publicly, uh, and that's when, the, by the way, you're right, Alan, in the sense they brought up the question about who he would appoint to the bench on the high court. Oh, boy. And and that's when this uh, whole conversation got into the living document, that he this is a living document that changes, and that's why we have these judges and all that. That was the conversation. Hey, Yogi, anything yeah. else, my friend? Hey, yeah, well, good evening. Like I said, you got a fine show. Hey, thank you very much. You drive safely out there, Yogi. That's Yogi checking in from the highway. And, uh, Alan, in the last four or five minutes here, What's your view uh, of this whole business with, uh, and, I, and I don't know whether you've been watching it or not, and, and I know you've discovered this thing with Foster, and I want to promote that, but this whole business with uh, Giuliani and Hillary Clinton back in New York pandering to the uh, poor people back there and, and, this, and these speeches she's making, is this not the same thing they've been doing all along uh, at the White House level, just, sure. just revisited again in New York level? Well, absolutely. I mean, they, they have no credibility, either Bill or Hillary Clinton. They have no credibility whatsoever. And uh, everything they do is calculated to get them votes. I mean, you saw Bill Clinton uh, pardon uh, these uh, Puerto Rican terrorists, right. even though people in the Justice Department, what, what few honest ones there are left, objected to that, law enforcement people, and uh, the FBI and other agencies objected to that. And he did that because he thought that that would garner uh, votes from the Puerto Rican community in New York for Hillary Clinton. Of course, it turns out that he was wrong on that, but that's the only possible motivation for doing that. That's how far these people will go to try and gain power. And one final question uh, along this same line, uh, because she's a lawyer, as you are, and uh, she's in the most powerful law enforcement position in the country, What's with Janet Reno continuing to block these things? Well, Janet Reno obviously is not interested in getting at the truth. Uh, we see that with the uh, uh, Chinese espionage uh, work and, and Clinton giving technology to the Chinese in exchange for campaign money to the DNC. I mean, it's so plain, and she won't investigate that. Uh, like you mentioned earlier, Waco, I mean, the Foster case, she could... She could order a proper investigation of that case, but she won't do it. She's, I think, just, she's just there to block things. I think it was you that said, if uh, and I know it was you, in one of our shows, and you said if this was your best friend, Foster was supposedly Clinton's best buddy, right? Well, not his best buddy, no. But uh, if he was somebody who was even an acquaintance, and you're the President of the United States, wouldn't you want Columbo? Wouldn't you want the best investigator, a Jerry Pierce, on this case? No, he has the Park Police investigating it with the FBI also doing some investigation, but not their best people, not their homicide experts. The, one of the, the lead park police investigators, John Roller, was his first homicide case. 
Yeah, and wouldn't you also do this? And I noticed when John Kennedy was shot in Dallas, they uh -huh. would not invite in the Dallas PD homicide team, and they did not invite in the Washington, D.C. Police Department homicide team on this case, did they? It was all left to the federal park. Park police. And, and the and, FBI. And, and the FBI. And uh, I've talked to an FBI agent uh, who told me that uh, the FBI agents who were chosen to work on the Foster case were not the best guys. No. We're not the well, best FBI guys. is not. I mean, we went through, uh, we've got some great guys on homicide in our FBI out here now because they learned through these Yosemite killings an awful lot about investigating murders. But when you have a deal like Foster, and, and you, I mean, you need to bring in a homicide investigator, a guy that's been in local police work. That's what they do day in and day out. And, and they can smell uh, a case and what it's all about before they even take a statement. I mean, that's, that's the experience level, the nuances of these things they know. But why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you bring in? Yeah, you wouldn't do it because if you don't want the truth to be found. You got that right, my friend. Listen, Alan, I'm a... Thank you a, a lot for coming on the show, and, and let's do another one right away. Thank you, and people should go to worldnetdaily.com and look for the article on the foster death. It's on there today. Let's let's get into this again when we have more time to, to get down into it uh, in more depth. And, okay, uh, I might have something more for you next week on this. Let's do it. Hey, okay. my friend. Thank you. Have a good weekend. You too. Thank you. That's Alan Favish. He's one of the sharpest lawyers I've ever met in my life. He's uh, formerly at Washington, D.C., now in Los Angeles County practicing law there, but he continues to follow on some certain cases involving unanswered questions in the Clinton administration. Uh, we're going to uh, probably not be here Monday night. There'll be a best of show on Monday night because my son and I are going to be uh, at a very special meeting in uh, the city of Los Angeles on Monday. We'll be back, however, on Tuesday. Uh, so until then, I want you to have a wonderful weekend. Thanks for joining us tonight and listening in. You lay off that whiskey. Let that cocaine be. And may the good Lord take a liking to you. The Radio Detective. Brought to you by the California Correctional Peace Officers Association. They walk the toughest beat in the state. And... Boots Camera, the P.I.'s Toy Store on Blackstone, south of Bullard, and the National Rifle Association, the last thing between you and gun prohibition, registration, and confiscation.